volunteers uh, who are too numerous um, to, uh, to list uh, that uh, put in a lot of hours and hard work uh, making this conference happen. Uh, and also thank you to Stanford University. We think this is a great facility uh, to have a conference like this, perfect location. So thank you very much uh, to Stanford and to the IEEE Computer Society for their technical uh, support. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, please, Stanford asks us uh, no food or uh, drinks in the auditorium except for bottled water, uh, which you're free to bring in. Uh, the restrooms are located uh, right outside and uh, down the steps out towards the break area. Uh, cell phones, please uh, turn them off or silence them uh, if you would, please. And we do have Wi-Fi access in here for uh, all of you. And uh, <clears throat> if you just bring up your browser, uh, the username and the password uh, are both Hot Chips 2009 all lowercase one word. And that runs up here on the interstitials um, every once in a while. So if you forget, uh, that'll be it. And so with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ralph Wittig, the uh, program committee chair, who will kick off the session. Yeah, thanks, Keith. Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you to Hot Chips uh, 21 uh, on behalf of the program committee. Uh, minor correction, I'm uh, a co-chair. Krista Asanovic, standing right, uh, sitting right here, is my co-chair. Uh, we have a great program for you. Um, despite the downturn year, we've had uh, uh, more submissions than any previous year. And uh, so if anything, this is a good sign that uh, the industry is going to innovate its way out of the recession. Um, and not let this one uh, get to us. So the attendance is down slightly. We kept up a strong attendance as well, which is a tremendous sign that there's a great interest in this uh, conference. We hope to uh, 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 please you with an interesting program. Uh, we've uh, got our usual sessions on servers uh, at the beginning and the very end. So on day one, we open up with the first server session. Uh, that's the mainstream server um, presentations for from AMD and Intel. We've got a talk by HP on blades in there as well. Uh, followed right by the keynote. Uh, we're really excited to have uh, Jensen Wang from uh, NVIDIA give us uh, his insights on uh, GPU computing. Um, right in the afternoon, we start with uh, the I.O. session. I.O.s are ever more important. We have to really feed this beast with uh, data. Um, and so we have a great mix of uh, uh, various I.O. chips. Um, we have uh, then, and we're going to try a different session. We're going to have academia try to explain to us how we're going to program all this parallelism. And so we asked all the different power labs uh, from uh, various schools in North America to come by and give a presentation. Uh, we'll have actually a joint uh, panel session at the end of this power lab talk uh, where you can uh, 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 ask them questions jointly. Um, we have uh, finishing off uh, the uh, program today, uh, a session on client processors. This is a field that we see as becoming ever more imp important. Uh, who does not have an iPhone or other mobile device? Uh, client processors uh, in uh, mobile devices, whether that's laptops or cell phones, are becoming really uh, uh, ever more important. So we have a nice session on that. Um, finally, in the evening, we, have, uh, we thought about a panel. And uh, the challenges really the industry is facing uh, is, is more about technology scaling and fab economics. Who can afford fabs these days? Uh, who still has fabs? Uh, if you don't have a fab, which fab do you choose? And what are the uh, scaling related issues uh, uh, people uh, using fab technology are facing? So we hope that panel will be quite interesting to you as well tonight. Um, tomorrow, we start the day with a session on accelerators. Uh, we really see, we had a great talk on OpenCL yesterday, mixing different uh, uh, computing uh, uh, architectures. Uh, we have a session on that tomorrow morning as well, where we have various accelerators uh, uh, being presented. Uh, second keynote is uh, a more lively one by Electronic Arts. We have their chief creative officer. Uh, they don't have a title of a CTO, but they have a title of a uh, chief creative officer. He's going to give us a nice talk about uh, where they see gaming going and how they see silicon advances uh, really affecting gaming. Um, we have a great session on uh, SOCs and clocking, uh, various insights from car-related uh, uh, chips, and uh, an interesting paper uh, on uh, MEMS-based oscillators and clocking. 
Uh, we have a session on FPGAs. Uh, this field is really uh, growing. FPGAs are becoming uh, quite important as volume drivers in fabs as well. So we have a mix of uh, the established players, Altair and Xilinx, as well as a startup, Silicon Blue, uh, which we found uh, interesting. And finally, closing the day, we have the second session on server chips. And that's really the high-end, massively scalable, massively parallel uh, cluster architecture chips. IBM, in, IBM is introdu introducing the new Power 7 series, and uh, Sun is introducing the latest uh, Rainbow Fall processor. So with that, I'd like to hand it over uh, to Randy, who's going to give a few uh, comments on um, the Computer History Museum. And I uh, thank you for coming, and uh, hope you enjoy the program. OK. Hi, I'm Randall Neff. I'm one of the senior tour docents and Babbage operators over at the Computer History Museum. And we've, uh, well, integrated circuits and computers have always been closely connected. This is the building in Mountain View on Shoreline. This was built by Silicon Graphics for the marketing department. It's a beautiful building, and it's our most expensive and largest artifact. Um, so we have one of two constructed Babbage difference engines. These were designed in 1847, 1849, but only recently built. The one we have belongs to Nathan Mervold, ex-CTO ex of Microsoft. He had the London Science Museum building one for his living room in Seattle, and he's loaned us to us for a couple of years. It has 8,000 metal parts. It has seven 31 decimal digit adders. It's pipelined. And you know, it's pipelined, and it's parallel processing, and it has a true ripple carry, and it does seven additions every six seconds, being hand cranked by an operator. So that's what a picture of it looks like in Babbage. Okay, there's two anniversaries this year. This is the 50th anniversary of the introduction of the IBM 1401. Most of you are too young to know that, but it was a very popular business computer. And so we're having a birthday party for it on November the 11th at the museum. Uh, we have two fully restored operational 1401s uh, re restored by retired IBM people, mumble mumble card reader, line printer, all the good stuff of state of the art 1959. Um, germanium alloy transistors, really fast guys, 11.5 microsecond cycle. That's one decimal digit add, core memory, line printer, all that stuff. Okay, the museum has a YouTube channel, and we have a fully a lecture series, and usually the lectures come up on our YouTube channel a couple of weeks after. So if you are not local, you can still attend the lectures virtually on the YouTube channel. We have a brand new exhibit coming on board. This current schedule is October of next year. This is what it looks like. It's about 40,000 square feet. Um, you know, interactive displays, all those exhibits, videos, all that fun stuff that you have in a museum. And that should be next year. So we have oral history. We restore computers. And of interest is the Semiconductor Special Interest Group. Uh, they're collecting lots of information about the history of integrated circuits. We have a new exhibit called the Silicon Engine. We're having a celebration of the 50th anniversary of the invention of the integrated circuit. That's what all you guys do. It started 50 years ago. This is a very early circuit done at Fairchild. Uh, other things the uh, special interest group does events. We have the 1401 anniversary on the 11th. We have a, every year we have a big fancy banquet fellows awards. This year we're doing uh, Robert Everett that worked on the whirlwind computer at MIT and also the Sage Air Defense computer. John Chamberlain that was involved with SQL and the four guys that invented the Intel 4004 microprocessor, which is why you all have jobs today. So how you can help? Well, money, right? Always money. Uh, mailing list, all that stuff. But probably the most important thing is a lot of you people that have had lots of experience, you have lots of interesting stuff in your basement or attic or whatever. And 
When you get around to cleaning out your house, you might ask if the museum would like to have it, that we are collecting history, you know, everything from published manuals to notes and lab notebooks and things like that, all of which we'd like to add to your collection. Okay, in the lobby is a table. It has more information on the museum. You're welcome to take, your, take some of that. There's also information on the IEEE and the IEEE Computer Society if you're not already a member of those. And that's it. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I'm Chris Kozirakis from Stanford University. And it's a pleasure to introduce the first session on server systems. In the past, the server session was, would mostly focus on the processor pipeline. But these days, system issues, both on-chip and off-chip, are also becoming very important challenges. So this session has three great talks, uh, two from AMD and Intel, telling us about the latest system technologies coming in their upcoming servers. And the third one telling us about how chip issues interact with the system issues, in this case, uh, Blade servers. So the first talk is uh, titled um, Formula One Blade Computing with the AMD MagniCores processor. And the presenter is Pat Conway. Uh, Pat is a principal member of the technical staff at AMD, where he's been there for eight years now. He holds a master's degree in the EE from the University College Cork in Ireland, and an MBA from Golden uh, Gate University. He has 11 published patents, and now he's managing a performance modeling team in Sunnyvale, which focuses on several workloads. Pat? Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about AMD's new server processor, which is codenamed MagniCore, and that's named after the Formula, <coughs> Formula One racetrack in France, which is where the Formula One comes from. Um, my talk today will cover the uh, AMD architecture since uh, the introduction of 64-bit extensions in 2003 with the Opteron, and um, up through the introduction of MagniCore, which will be introduced in uh, Q1 of 2010. Um, I'll go through some of the driving forces that led us to MagniCore, which is a 12-core, 12, um, 12 independent um, x86 cores. Um, and what MagniCore is, basically, it's, uh, it's a MCM, a multi-chip module, with uh, two silicon die integrated. And um, uh, it, has, it goes into a new socket for AMD, the G34 socket. Um, it's, it's, it's really targeted at providing very high compute density in the 2P and 4P blade server space, so 2P blades, 4P rack-mounted servers. And um, <clears throat> from an architecture point of view, one of the, um, one of the key enabling uh, features on MagniCore is a feature which we call HT Assist at the platform level and uh, the probe filter uh, at the microarchitecture level. And um, I'll go into some detail on the implementation and organization of the probe filter. Um, I'll cover the cache coherence protocol, transaction scenarios, and frequencies, and what the benefits of the probe filter are in our systems. Um, and finally, I'll wrap up with a look ahead at uh, what will follow MagniCore on AMD's server roadmap. Um, <clears throat> So, as I mentioned, in 2003, uh, we introduced um, the Optron, and that was the first processor with 64-bit extensions. And uh, that was significant in that we, we opened up the instruction set architecture um, to, um, to support um, enterprise-level applications. And uh, that was a 90-nanometer design. It was K8 core, had a one-megabyte L2 cache, had three hypertransport ports running at 1.6 gigatransfers a second, and it had two DDR1 uh, channels running at 300 megahertz. And that was followed in 2005 by a dual-core version of the same architecture. Uh, and then 
Um, in 2007, we introduced uh, Barcelona, which was a four core part, with, um, which was on 65 nanometer silicon insulator with a, with a three level cache hierarchy, a 512 kilobyte L2, a two megabyte L3, and uh, we upped the frequency of hypertransport to two gigatransfers and had two DDR channels. Uh, that in turn was followed by Shanghai, where we increased the size of the L3 cache um, and uh, the f supported DDR2 800. And in May of this year, we introduced Istanbul, which is this 45 nanometer uh, design um, with six cores and a um, uh, um, DDR2 1066. And today's talk is going to be describing uh, MagniCore, which is a MCM, so it's, think of it as Istanbul times two. Um, it has 12 cores, uh, a total of 12 megabyte of L3 cache. It goes into a new socket, the G34 socket, um, which is um, up th from 2003 to 2009, we've had the Rev F uh, socket, a 1207 pin socket. Now we go to a nine, <coughs> 1944 pin socket for MagniCore and going forward. And that has four hypertransport ports running at 6.4 gigatransfers a second and has four DDR3 uh, memory channels running at 1333. Um, so since the introduction of the Optron in um, 2003, we've seen a steady progression in performance gain, we're about 30% a year compounded. Uh, from the, this is a, a graph of spec rate floating point and spec rate integer. And um, we've seen a steady progression in performance up over this time um, through Istanbul this year. And uh, what's interesting is that this gain in performance has come while operating within the same power envelope. So there's been no significant increase in the power, but um, we've seen steady increases in throughput. And for example, going from the four core Shanghai in last year through Istanbul this year, we saw an increase of 34% in performance in the same power envelope. And uh, we, s we expect to see a significant increase going from Istanbul to MagniCore also, which will also operate within the same power envelope. So what were the driving forces that led us to um, introduce MagniCore? Well, first and foremost is we we're taking advantage of thread level parallelism. Um, that's, you know, that's present in many enterprise level apps. And we also want to leverage MCM um, technology, uh, which is something new to AMD. And um, this architecture, high thread density maps well to some trends, current trends like virtualization. We want to maximize the number of virtual machines that can run on a server. And a very common operating mode for virtual machines is to run one VM per core. So this is a 12 core, 12 independent cores um, with no interference between them. And uh, so you provide a certain QoS by having a dedicated core per, th per, per VM. And another important trend is energy proportional computing, where we provide more performance, more throughput uh, with no increase in, um, in power. And also um, for the case where the part is idle, we uh, conserve power. And finally, in today's economy, economics is a big driver as well. The uh, MagniCore design uses the Istanbul silicon. So um, we get a, a big design efficiencies from doing that. Uh, you know, one of which is um, invalidation. I mean, it speeds qualification, uh, <clears throat> both for AMD and also for our customers um, time to market. So we expect it to be a, a relatively speedy <clears throat> follow on from Istanbul. And the second factor is um, <clears throat> the die is a fairly reasonable die size, so we can fit two die uh, per reticle. And this has the advantage that, um, you know, it helps uh, ensure supply chain stability, um, at which, and also um, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the yield 
the yield manufacturing costs ultimately benefit uh, customers. So here's a picture of the main core silicon. Uh, uh, six cores, uh, three, four, five, and each core has a 512 kilobyte L2. Uh, there is a shared six megabyte L3. There are four hypertransport links, uh, one, two, three, four. There are two DDR3 channels, uh, and it's manufactured by um, global foundries, the AMD subsidiary. Uh, it's about 900 million transistors. So this is a logical view of uh, mining core. And um, th what this is on the left-hand side is the package. This is what the MCM package looks like. Um, um, so as you can see here, um, there are two die. Each die has two DDR3 memory channels. And um, this, uh, this is a logical representation here of this package. So the lower die has two memory channels. We bring off um, one uh, hypertransport three port here for IO so non-coherent hypertransport, and we bring off one and a half uh, hypertransport um, ports for coherent HT. And the one thing to point out about hypertransport three is the links are what we call ungangable. It's a 16-bit port, but you can operate it as two independent 8-bit ports, if you like, and that gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of topologies and hooking up these processors. Um, so, um, the other thing to note is that, so from the point of view of coherent hypertransport, um, it's a symmetric topology. So you have one and a half hypertransport ports connected to the upper die, one and a half hypertransport ports connected to the lower die. Um, and the, it's asymmetric from the point of view of non-coherent hypertransport in that um, we decided we wanted to have one wide hypertransport port connecting to I.O. Uh, rather than having, for example, an 8-bit here and an 8-bit up there, which would require, um, which would lower the peak bandwidth to I.O. So the main thing to point to notice is that the die, the silicon die here, has six cores, has four hypertransport ports, and has two memory channels. And the package has 12 cores, four hypertransport ports and four memory channels. And um, it plugs into uh, a G334 socket. I mentioned this earlier. G3 is generation three and the four signifies four DDR3 channels. And um, another point to note about the, this architecture is it's directly connected. Um, so there is a dedicated link connecting the the, the two die on the package, and then we bring off dedicated links from the lower die and dedicated links from the upper die. Um, so this, this is kind of in contrast you know, to other um, MCM approaches. So uh, given that building block, the, these are the uh, architectures, the 2P and the 4P architectures that you can build with uh, MagniCore. So the box here indicates one package, uh, there are the two die in the package, and it's, you'll notice that from a, a node point of view, it's fully connected. There's a path connecting every pair of nodes in the architecture, and there's a 16-bit channel connecting to, um, to each package. So this, this gives you the optimum um, topology for the 2P blade, which is where the meat of the market is for blade servers. And so we, when, we, when we designed the package and the, you know, the interconnect, we designed it with these two topologies in mind up front. So we, we did the package design, we did the motherboard design, and silicon all kind of was done concurrently to, to come up with an optimum 2P and 4P topology. So this has a diameter one topology. I can get to memory on any node with one hop. Um, the DRAM bandwidth, there are four DDR3 channels coming off each package. So that gives you a total uh, peak DRAM bandwidth of 85.6 gigabytes a second. 
and uh, crossfire bandwidth. This is a metric we use to measure the interconnect bandwidth. Um, and so what this is, if, if this processor is accessing its own memory and that of every other node in an interleaved fashion, and all four processors are doing the same thing, what is the total data bandwidth that you can support across the interconnect? And that's 71.7 gigabytes a second. And the, a point to notice between the 4P and the 2P, um, well, first of all, the 4P, um, from a package point of view, it's fully connected. You'll notice that there are two planes. There's the upper plane, which are four, the top four nodes are fully connected, and the bottom four nodes are fully connected. And the um, diameter of this topology is two. So I can get from this node to any other node, for example, P1 to P6 in two hops up here and there. So it's a diameter two topology, and the DRAM bandwidth is double, the 2P, and the crossfire bandwidth is also double. So, you know, that, that's a nice attribute from getting scalable performance. <clears throat> this is what the MagniCore um, silicon die looks like. It's the same as Istanbul. It has six cores, independent cores, with a 512 kilobyte L2. They share a six megabyte L3. There's a crossbar. There's a memory controller with two DDR3 channels, four hypertransport 3 channels. And we have this structure here, uh, which is, um, it's called, we call it the probe filter. And uh, this is something that you can enable or not enable in BIOS. So in a small 1P system, you would probably not enable it. You wouldn't enable it. You don't need it. But in a 4P magnet core, uh, you definitely need it. And the storage associated with this comes from the L3. So this takes advantage of the fact that the memory controller is on the same die as the L3 cache. So this is something new. And um, we feel it gives us, uh, there, there's some, I'll talk about it in more detail. Um, so the probe filter, the, we call it hypertransport assist at the platform and the probe filter at the, in the microarchitecture. Basically, this is how our coherence protocol works. If this is a two socket magnet core here, and this is the requesting node, and this is the home node, our request goes to the home node, we broadcast probes, collect the probe responses and the data, and then we return the data to the requesting core. Uh, with the probe filter, we track all the cache lines in the system at the home node. So with, for clean data, a request goes from the requesting node to the home node, and we, we can return, if it's uncached, we can return the data and you're done. And there's no, no probes and no probe responses. And for the case of dirty data, you go to the home node. If the owning node is here, then a directed probe is sent here. And finally, we return a cache response. So the, the probe filter eliminates a lot of the protocol overhead associated with broadcast coherence. Uh, so it saves bandwidth and it also saves latency in a very important uh, case. So latency under load and uh, local memory latency are reduced. So this just revisits the point I made earlier. Where do we put this probe filter? Because we have one silicon design which we want to go both in desktops and workstations. And so, you know, real estate is at a premium on a, on a processor die. So our trick was to steal, think of the L3 as being organized as a, you know, 16 ways. What we do is we take one or two ways. It's programmable. We can take a, a programmable amount of the L3 for the directory store. And having it stored, the L3 is a very fast SRAM and having it stored in SRAM gives you several benefits. The, your access latency is low. Your port latency, most operations at the probe filter are read, modify, write. So that's a very efficient operation in SRAM. And your indirection latency for the case of cache to cache is also very low. Uh, so what, what does a pro filter entry look like? On uh, x86, we have a 64-byte native cache line. So 64-byte, and we use our pro filter entry is four bytes. So the L3, we take a line from the L3 data array. And we partition it into an array of four ways by four sets. And each entry in the pro filter 
it looks like this. There's an address tag, there's a state encoding, and there's an owner. So these, these uh, briefly are the, the states we support. Exclusive modified, or modified, it's ambiguous in the pro filter. The own state, the S state, shared state, S with one entry, and of course the invalid state as well. Uh, and our, well, what is our protocol with the pro filter? So basically we track all lines in the ME modified, exclusive, owned or shared states in the probe filter. So the probe filter is fully inclusive of the other caches. So if a line is cached in the system, there must be a probe filter entry. And what that means is the presence of a probe filter entry says that the line is cached in mod one of those states. And more importantly, the absence of a probe filter entry says that the line is uncached. And that turns out to be a very important case here. Um, and one interesting thing going from uh, Opteron, which had a broadcast protocol, to um, Istanbul and MagniCore, is that we, we, in the original protocol, we had about 25 messages. And um, to support the probe filter, we only had to do, introduce two new messages, uh, one of which was a directed probe for when you hit in the probe filter, and the other was a notification message. Whenever you drop a line from, out of the cache from the exclusive state, uh, you'd have to notify the probe filter so it frees up the probe filter entry. And uh, this may be a little deep, but whatever. Um, probe filter transaction scenarios. So from the point of view of the probe filter, there are, only th there are three types of transaction that it needs to support. There's, there's instruction fetch, there's data load, and there's data store. And when one of these goes to the probe filter, one of two things can happen. You can either hit or you can miss. If you hit, then the line, a hit is an address tag match, so uh, one of these, one of the entry must be one of these um, states, so invalid, own, shared, or exclusive modified. And if you miss, um, if you miss in the probe filter, um, you, you may, the, the entry, there may be an entry in the I state available, but if the probe filter is completely full, you have to free up an entry to, make, to use. So, so if the entry that you have to cast out, uh, these are the cases, you, the entry that you cast out could be either O or S or, or S1 or EM. Um, and so this is a color-coded chart here. If it's green, it's filtered. You can service the request with no probe, you can just return the data immediately. If it's this yellow case, um, you send a single directed probe. So for example, an example of the filter case would be if I'm doing a code fetch and the line is in the shared state, cached in the shared state, I can return that line with no probe. Uh, for the load case, if the line is in the exclusive or modified state in somebody's cache, I can simply do a single directed probe and return the data. And then um, for the case of a store, if the line, for example, is shared, and I want to um, store to the line, then I need to invalidate all the sharers. That's a broadcast case. So basically, you could, the, uh, it's very, depending on the precise scenario, you can either filter the probes or you have the broadcast case. And so, you know, Filtered is effective and broadcast is ineffective. Um, and so you might wonder, well, what is the frequency with which these cases occur? And um, it turns out that, you know, for many workloads, it's the missed case uh, is the most frequent case. And then within this category, it's the, the invalid case. There's usually an invalid entry available. So roughly, you know, for spec web, um, e-commerce, roughly two-thirds of all case transaction scenarios fall in this case, and of those, about two-thirds fall under this category. And so your, your traditional cash rate miss ratio is uh, not a suitable metric for, um, for, for measuring the effectiveness of the probe filter, um, uh, because the miss rate, missing, can actually be beneficial. Um, 
And just very briefly, the coverage ratio, this is a two socket magnet core showing two nodes. Each node has, um, when the probe filter is enabled, you have five meg of L3 and six, three meg of L2. And with one meg of the L3 devoted to the probe filter, you, get, you get, have enough lines to cover 256K lines. And so that, the ratio of this to this is two. So that's the coverage ratio of twice as many entries in the probe filter as you have cached lines in the system. And this is kind of a lower bound because with sharing, code is typically shared then one single probe filter entry may cover mul multiple um, cached copies in the system. And then the worst case transient hotspotting will be where all the nodes in the system target the memory on one node. Um, and so all the cache lines, th this probe filter has to track all the cache lines in the system. And even in that case, with one meg given to the L3, the absolute worst pathological case is 0.5. And you can always make the probe filter larger. But of all the workloads I've looked at, this is m much more typical, two or three. So uh, what, what is the significance of, hy of hypertransport assist and memory latency? Well, with the old protocol, it used to be that memory latency was set by the longer of two paths, the time it took to access data in DRAM and the time it took to probe all the caches in the system. But with the uh, probe filter, um, a very important case is access to local memory. If I'm going to local memory, I can get return data uh, with in around 50 nanoseconds, where, whereas in a four socket magnet core, if I had to broadcast, the latency would be around 110. So you see uh, a significant reduction in local memory latency due to the probe filter. Um, and it's interesting to point out that a lot of server workloads um, have local accesses, naturally have local accesses, uh, like SpecInt, SpecFP, VMMark, SpecPower. So the probe filter amplifies the benefit of any workload which has um, NUMA optimizations baked into it. Finally, um, what follows MagniCore? Um, well, there is a, a socket compatible upgrade to MagniCore planned, and it will have more cores, even more cores. It'll have the same, um, have more cache per, to maintain the cache per core balance. It'll operate in the same power envelope, and it'll have fine grain power management. And we have a new processor core, codenamed Bulldozer, in development, which um, is a brand new top to bottom uh, microarchitecture, x86 architecture. It's a 32 nanometer design. It has uh, instruction set extensions and higher memory level pal parallelism. Thank you. So we've got time for a few questions. You could please uh, step to one of the microphones and state your name and affiliation first. Hi, Toshi from Apple. Um, so, uh, f from Istanbul to this, uh, like, 2x core, uh, you mentioned the power envelope is still the same, but the technology, process technology is still the same node, and how come it is possible to maintain the same power envelope? Okay. Um, well, typically, uh, if, you double, if you double the number of cores, you're halving the power budget per core. And it's kind of, that typically results in about a 25% frequency reduction, all else being equal. So uh, basically we lower the frequency. And also we've uh, added some power, uh, fine grain power management. So we're trying to conserve power wherever we can. And um, also 12 cores is obviously gonna run at a lower frequency than uh, six core Istanbul in the same power envelope. But we have some flexibility, you know, on setting the power envelope as well. So could, could you uh, guess what is the clock frequency that you're going to be shooting for? Uh, that, that's a detail we're going to save for the product launch in uh, Q1 2010. Go ahead. Christopher Silas, UC Berkeley. So how does the associativity of the um, a probe filter compare with the associativity for last level caches. You mentioned that the capacity was with a factor of two, but I'm curious about the associativity in that. 
Yeah, and well, the, we have a kind of a tiled implementation of the L3 cache. So the associativity, depending on how you measure it, is between 32, it's around 48, 48 ways. Um, that's a good point. The associativity of the pro filter is four. So the way we, we try to compensate for that mismatch in associativity with, with capacity. So it's, uh, we have 2x the capacity that we need. Uh, Bill Rash, uh, Intel. The uh, diagram for uh, MagniCore showed what appeared to be both uh, a 16-bit and an 8-bit link between the two die and the package. Right. Um, if that was correct, uh, what was the purpose of showing of running both an 8-bit and a 16-bit link? Why not two 16-bit links? Um, that's a good question. Uh, we basically, remember I pointed out it was an asymmetric topology. We took one 16-bit link for I.O. We, we made a, a d decision that is preferable to have one wide link going to one node. And so that introduces an asymmetry. That leaves on the lower node, there's two nodes right on the lower node, that leaves um, two and a half links. So we need one and a half links coming off to connect, to build a fully connected two way. So that leaves one and a half links to connect to the two die. It's just, that's what, that, that's an engineering trade off. Okay, thank you. So the second talk in the session is on the Nihelemi X CPU, and it's presented by Msiles uh, Kotapali, who is a server architect at Intel, and he's been the co-lead of the Nihelemi X design. Thanks, Christoph. Good morning, everybody. So I'm going to talk about the Nehelami X CPU architecture. Um, right, so, um, do we know how we fix the display? Ah, okay, good. Um, okay, so uh, today what we're going to cover uh, is essentially the high-level architecture of the processor and focus on, on the attributes that are important for enterprise server. Uh, what we wouldn't be covering is the detailed product clock speeds, the detailed performance, either uh, any workload or application, and also we wouldn't be talking about future Intel server roadmap. There's also uh, some of the information, especially around the cores and the protocols and the, uh, that has been uh, uh, released in, in public earlier, so we, would be, we wouldn't be spending too much time on that, and there is, uh, point us to externally visible website or accessible website that's provided. So, uh, so essentially what we'd be covering is, is starting with the core and, and focusing uh, primarily on what we call the, the uncore and the system aspects of the processor. The last level cache, the system agent, the caching agent, the coherence agent, uh, memory controller, system interconnect. And I'll briefly hit on the performance aspects and, and uh, uh, conclude. So over the last few years, uh, Intel has been on this uh, a CPU development paradigm called the TikTok paradigm. What it is is essentially a, a two-year new architecture cadence that's overlapped with a, a, in a skewed manner with two-year process generation cadence to arrive at a one-year uh, processor development model. And essentially, Nihalem is Intel's uh, 45 nanometer microarchitecture and also the converged core. And Nihalem EX is the enterprise or what we call the expandable server in the 45 nanometer generation. So essentially, the, the key uh, aspect of the architecture is a modular architecture. We have what is called as the converged core, essentially all the client and the server process use the same core, and there is a very little unique customization for each segment. There is, is a small bit. Uh, and there's been information about this core that's been released in public. In fact, last year at Hotchips, there was a client CPU presentation that uh, I would guide people to. And the Encore is where most of the differentiation is built into and in the as system aspects. And essentially what it contains is the level three cache. Each core contains two levels of cache. Uh, the first level I and D cache, which are independent, and a second level shared 256 kilobyte cache, and then a third level cache. Uh, there's integrated memory controller, 
uh, QPI for external system interface, and then power management, clocking, and so on. So uh, this is what the Nehalemi XCPU looks like. Uh, it is a monolithic single die CPU. It has eight Nehalem cores, and uh, each of the cores supports uh, uh, multi-threading, simultaneous multi-threading, so there are 16 threads per socket. Uh, it supports a large 24 meg shared last level cache. Uh, it has two integrated memory controllers with a scalable memory interconnect inter uh, architecture that in turn actually allows uh, scaling to eight DDR channels uh, attaching to each of the socket indirectly. There are four uh, QPI links, uh, which run up to 6.4 gigatransfers per second, and we support uh, a number of flexible platform topologies uh, with two socket, four socket, eight socket in the glueless uh, fashion, and even larger systems using node controller, uh, 1632, and in some cases greater than one kilo. And the key point about this processor is that there are 2.3 billion transistors. And at the time this comes out, we believe this will be the biggest processor in terms of transistor count. So what does the overall high-level microarchitecture look like? So as we said, uh, we start with like eight Nehalem cores. Uh, the cores are very modular, and they're built for high throughput. They, they sustain a large number of outstanding requests. And one of the important attributes about the enterprise servers is essentially a, a last level or a large last level cache. Uh, uh, so Nehalem EX builds a 24 megabyte of large shared cache. And, and in terms of the cache, the main attributes of the cache that are needed is that the capacity is one aspect, lower latency and higher bandwidth are the other aspects that are important. And especially with eight and 16 threads, eight cores and 16 threads sharing it. So uh, the way we build it is we build a partition cache with the physical address uh, that's supported in the cache is, is striped across all the partitions. And what it does is it enables each partition to act as a cache on its own, but the physical address striping allows it to be shared. And essentially, so you can think of it as an eight-ported cache that, that uh, allows an access every two clocks. So it allows for a massive amount of uh, bandwidth. The other aspect is that this cache is built as an inclusive cache, and, and it allows us to manage the amount of uh, traffic that needs to be run to the cores, especially when we need to uh, maintain coherence and invalidate cores or, or move data from the cores. A lot of that information is managed through uh, something we call the core valid bits that are uh, maintained in the last level cache. It, it reduces the, the snoop latency and the memory latency as well as uh, reduces some of the traffic when we have to invalidate cache lines and so on. Right? That helps uh, scalability within the processor. So one of the other aspects, once we have a big cache and high bandwidth cache that's built, is essentially how we hook it up. On the Halem EX, we build what is called as the ring interface, or the ring interconnect architecture, which is simple, a simple uh, a ring topology which connects all the agents in the cache agents. Uh, and essentially, in order to reduce the latency and improve bandwidth, we build a bidirectional, uh, bidirectional rings. What it does is over a unidirectional ring, it cuts down the, the average latency uh, between a, a requester and a responder within the cache. And it also improves the bandwidth uh, by 4x. The, uh, the protocol itself uh, is a simple a rotary type uh, protocol, uh, essentially traffic on the ring proceeds one stop at a time, and, and traffic on the ring has higher priority than the traffic that's trying to enter. Both the cores and the, and the caches themselves are, are, are able to inject traffic, and essentially the cache slices also act as the, the sink. Uh, and, and one of the key attributes is that uh, target only gets to actually sync one of the messages in a clock, so essentially it looks at either one of the uh, clockwise or counterclockwise clock direction in a clock, and essentially the injection rules onto the ring really take care to make sure that no target actually in, ends up seeing two different packets at the same time. And essentially uh, built for a really scalable fabric. Uh, one of the things we found is that as you add more of the cores and the cache lices, it actually, the bandwidth scales along with it, it sustains that. 
And we've simulated massive amounts of uh, cache bandwidth. So one of the things, uh, yesterday there was a tutorial on, on the QPI high-level architecture. I think Bob actually went over the details. Uh, we don't discuss the details of the protocol here, but Nehalem EX supports a, a QPI Snoopy protocol. Essentially, it's a source broadcast protocol. Uh, and, and essentially, the, the cache, the, we, we talked about eight partitions, the cache being partitioned into eight blocks. Uh, each of the four partitions actually essentially represents as one requesting node or the caching agent, what we call as the caching agent on the protocol. Um, and that's what is shown as, as two essentially uh, clouds or clumps here. Uh, and each one basically manages the requests that are generated from that particular address space, which is hashed. And, and th this allows us to actually build a, a really scalable fabric where we have a large number of requests that can be sustained from the caching agent. In this particular case, uh, we can actually sustain uh, uh, 48 from each caching agent or about 96 requests. So essentially, and, and one of the other attributes is that we can have all of those 96 requests actually be accessing local memory which is attached to the socket. So it builds for a lot of uh, high throughput. Uh, the other thing is also that uh, the, given the Snoopy protocol, we also ensure that uh, we have high amount of Snoop throughput in order to make sure that it, it actually scales well and also that it's not uh, really become a latency uh, bottleneck. And each of the socket is capable of uh, processing 120 uh, Snoops at a time. So there's a massive amount of, of buffering that's built in in order to be able to sustain that level of uh, Snoops. Uh, there's also a local memory bypass that's built in. So if you look at it, uh, there is a, a each of the, the two caching agents that are built in, and and it's, and, and uh, there is a home agent that we'll talk in a bit. But essentially, that's the portion that manages uh, that that manages the coherence for the memory. And essentially, there's local bypass that's built for the local memory. Okay. So next, the, the, the complementary side of the caching agent is really the requesting side, which is really what we call the home agent in the QPI parlance. Uh, so again, similar to the caching agents, there are two home agents uh, that are uh, in the, built in the processor. And again, home agent is the one that actually manages all the system coherence, memory ordering, and actually also is responsible for completion of the transaction and returning data from memory if none of the other caching agents were able to forward the data. So, so essentially, it's, it's the main uh, coherence processing agent. Um, and we also support uh, what is called as a, a hybrid protocol. Essentially, all the uh, CPUs interact in what is called as the Snoopy protocol. And then the, all the I.O. agents essentially participate through uh, a directory coherence protocol. Uh, because the I.O. agents uh, essentially can't keep up with the snoop rate. So, so the CPU supports both. And again, the home agent is where we, pro we build in most of the system uh, attributes in, including what type of system profiles and, and system uh, CPU cons and so on we support. And, and QPI is a pre-allocated protocol, so all the requests that are uh, sent into the system are tracked by one or the other home agent, especially the coherent requests. Uh, and, and so each of the home agent really supports up to 256 outstanding transactions that they can track, with any one agent being able to track up to uh, 48 requests. Again, so, uh, and also the different topologies that we support allows for a very flexible large systems, including two, four, and with different number of I.O. agents and node controllers. In addition, there are a, a, a couple of important optimizations that we actually support at the home agent. The first one is the, the memory prefetch. So as we're doing source uh, snoop uh, processing, we also go fetch the data from memory so that by the time the, so the snoop or the coherence uh, processing is completed, we're able to actually get the data from memory and return it. The second one is basically the optimization that we do on the writes. So we do something called write posting so that when the memory requests come in, memory write requests come in, we're able to complete it while we're actually sending the write to the actual memory. So this allows for the, the, the global ordering to be 
to be quicker and also for the right transactions to complete early. The other big part of, of the system architecture on Nehalem EX was essentially the uh, memory architecture that we support. Uh, so uh, similar to the home agents and other, every other agents, there are two memory controllers uh, on the die for high bandwidth. Uh, but more than that, we also have an architecture that supports uh, really high capacity and, and simultaneously high bandwidth. So what we have is each of the memory controller actually uh, interfaces using what is called as the scalable memory interconnect, which is a high-speed interconnect, uh, which goes up to 6.4 giga transfers. And it actually, in turn, uh, talks to two uh, scalable memory buffers, which actually sit on the platform board. Uh, and then each buffer, in turn, actually supports two DDR channels. So in total, that adds up to eight DDR channels, which, you know, two DIMMs per channel. So that allows for really large memory capacity to be supported. In addition, because the, the interface to the memory buffer is really high speed, it's, it's, it's more like QPI and it's bidirectional. So it allows to actually simultaneously satisfy reads and writes. So that actually allows for really high bandwidth, even, even at high capacity. In addition, the memory controller is also built for really high bandwidth and also for uh, lower latency. It supports, it, it's able to schedule over a large number of outstanding transactions at a particular time, and it actually does a lot of out-of-order scheduling, at, and it manages the, the conflicts at a rank granular level. And it uh, supports open page, closed page, and adapto page policies for lower latency and higher bandwidth. So in addition, so on top of that, we support for all the requests that actually either need to go outside the socket or for all the coherence traffic, uh, we support four QPI links for, uh, which supports all kinds of topologies. Uh, each of the link is, it supports uh, 6.4 giga transfer. It is a packetized point-to-point -point interface. Again, this was probably discussed in detail in yesterday's tutorial. Uh, again, it, it enables uh, really uh, optimal, scalable, flexible platforms. There are a few platform topologies that I'm going to show. And, and it supports 25.6 uh, gigabytes per second of peak bandwidth per link. That's the amount of uh, bandwidth it supports. So internally, all of these links and all the other agents in the CPU are connected through a, a, a high bandwidth crossbar router. So we have a eight-ported router, which interconnects all the four QPI links, and then the, the two caching agents and the two home agents. So this is really the hub through which we actually make requests to the external memory or send snoops out or for requests coming from external sockets uh, to all the way to the memory controllers and the home agents, right, including and also for snoop processing. So one of the key things that we get out of this router design is that uh, it allows for a lot of the external traffic to, uh, to efficiently flow through the socket without interacting with a lot of the so traffic within the socket. So we support uh, route through capabilities that also allows us to build non-fully connected topologies. And there are a lot of, uh, the, the router itself is uh, fully programmable, so we can actually build a lot of flexible topologies by just uh, programming the routing algorithm statically. It supports a lot of uh, advanced routing uh, protocols like broadcasting and things like that. In case of, uh, because the process supports a so snoopy protocol uh, in a non-connected, non-fully connected, non -fully connected uh, topologies, we're actually able to send fewer number of snoop messages, which in turn get to the intermediate point and they get broadcast from there. So it actually reduces the number of uh, uh, packets that actually need to be generated in the system. And we also support uh, uh, multiple deadlock-free networks. Um, again, this, is, this allows us to build really complex topologies which are not fully connected, uh, and also allows us to support a lot of interesting uh, um, advanced RAS features like memory mirroring and cross-socket mirroring and so on. So here's a, a four-socket topology that we support. Uh, uh, this one shows a, a fully connected four sockets uh, with two IOHs. 
uh, again, as part of scalability, one of the key things that we uh, allow is, you know, the, even the I.O. capacity and bandwidth can be scaled. Uh, we also support one I.O.H. topology as well as uh, three I.O.H. topologies in four sockets. Right? And as you can see, there are four QPR links, sort of which three are used for inter-CPU communication, and, and one from each socket is connecting to the I.O. hub. And, and again, because we support route through, uh, IO hubs can access memory on any of the sockets. On this slide, we have a, a glueless eight socket topology. Uh, the topology here is what we call as a, a twisted hypercube connection. Uh, one of the important attributes of this is that uh, regardless of uh, whichever CPU you pick, uh, there's a maximum of two hops to any other CPU. Uh, there are about three CPUs which are at one hop, and there are four CPUs which are at two hops. And uh, IO, IO hub to the CPU is three hops max. Uh, again, uh, similar to the, uh, the four socket case, we support uh, either two or four IO hubs, uh, as, as the choice might be. Uh, what is not shown here is a number of node controller topologies that we support, and also two. Uh, two socket topology that is not shown, but but uh, we could either support a node controller in in a two socket with a node controller, or or even with a four socket with node controller uh, that allows scaling up to 16, 32, and and you know lots of sockets beyond that. It was interesting that uh, Ralph actually said that uh, the second session is focused on really large scalable servers. We actually expect this socket to get into uh, systems which are 2K sockets in size. So this one is, is a high-level you know, obligatory and also obfuscated performance slides uh, uh, that I'm allowed to show. Uh, I think the main thing that this slide is trying to show is that uh, Nehal MEX will provide a, a significant one, once-in-a-lifetime generational jump over the uh, previous server products. And, and on the left is basically the uh, Nehal MEP and the generational jump over its predecessor. And this one basically says we expect the performance jump to be higher. And the only uh, specific a accurate number that's shown here is basically the memory bandwidth. We expect a 9x improvement in memory bandwidth over the previous platform. So we expect uh, this processor to have really impressive amounts of performance boost over the prior Intel pro uh, enterprise server processor. Again, uh, in, in summary, so, uh, uh, this is the, the next generation enterprise server, and, and the, the primary focus is really around scalability, scalability within the socket, scalability outside of the socket, really large caches, high throughput, and so on. And it also supports lots of interesting and, and you know, flexible tip, topologies. So that's all I had. So Silas was kind enough to finish early, so we can rework him with many questions. Yeah, uh, Jose Dato from UPV in Spain. Um, yesterday during the uh, tutorial on um, QPI, it was mentioned that there were three uh, virtual channels. The uh, virtual cha two Dell free virtual channels, uh, virtual channel A. Uh, I don't know whether this stands for adaptive or, or something like this. Uh, uh, did, you didn't mention it. Is it possible to, use, to implement fully adaptive running using those uh, three virtual channels uh, among no controllers, I mean? Yes. Um, so one of the key thing is that uh, we actually, as far as the processor is concerned, we, do, we did implement adaptive routing capabilities, uh, but from an engineering uh, trade in a standpoint, we're, we are leaning against not productizing it in the first generation, but yeah, the architecture supports it, and the implementation also did factor it in. We do support mm -hmm. adaptive. Thank you. So I have a question as well. Uh, trying to contrast this talk to the previous one, uh, does the Nihel MEX support any filtering of probe requests, or you just support high bandwidth for probing, and that's the way to do it? No, uh, so yeah, we do not support uh, probe filtering. And then one of the important aspects about probe filtering is um, 
the amount of uh, traffic needed to, to manage that is also difficult, especially if you have uh, source broadcast protocol. Uh, and also the other thing was, um, uh, when we were building ALMEX, the, 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 the protocol that you pick also depends on, on the other attributes, like the cache capacity. Uh, one of the things is that when you have uh, large caches uh, in enterprise workloads, you also get large amount of cache to cache transfer. There's a lot of working set which is captured among the multiple process caches. And you gotta make sure that you optimize for the latency of those requests, right? So in order to manage that, the source Snoopy is the best way instead of going to the probe filter and then really broadcasting uh, uh, probes from there. So those were the different considerations. Yeah, I think the, one of the key things is that the cache size uh, is, is much different. Well, let, let's thank Silas again. Thank you. Uh, so now we're switching from uh, talking about chips to talking about the systems. Uh, the next talk is titled Innovation Envelopes, Hot Chips and Blades, uh, and the presenter is uh, Kevin Lay from HP. Uh, Kevin has been with uh, Compaq and then HP for 22 years now, and since the late 80s he's been architecting and designing modular servers, and uh, recently he's been the lead architect for the HP Blade System C class. Uh, he holds an uh, electrical engineering degree from uh, Rangoon Institute of Technology in Burma, and a master's and PhD degree from the University of Houston. Uh, good morning. Well, uh, here are the contributors to make this paper uh, possible. So, um, blade servers have solved many of the problems in data centers uh, where you use uh, rack mount servers, including uh, cable management, uh, power, thermal, uh, ease of use, and so on. The, um, there are uh, things that blades uh, help uh, chips to be innovated, and in turn, how these chip innovations help blade servers to be even more desirable. Uh, I'll illustrate uh, using uh, three case studies uh, in the uh, Ethernet area, even though there are many areas and uh, many case studies that we can talk about. Uh, the, um, I'll, I'll use about three slides to, to set the stage, and uh, then the, uh, the case studies will be about 10 slides, which is a bulk of the, this talk. And I'll close the, uh, the talk by share with you a few thoughts along the line of uh, future uh, chip innovation uh, opportunities. So when we talk about a system design, of course there are things that, that, uh, that we have to address in terms of like uh, complying or, or, or conforming with the uh, uh, industry or uh, de facto standards. And of course, uh, when you actually sell products, you need to look at uh, like market requirements and, and differentiating features and so on. A lot of times these uh, system designs, especially for example in the rack mount servers, you go by you know, per generation basis. And in other words, you can improve if you, if you want to do more things differently, you, can, you have a chance for the next generation. Right? However, in some environments such as in blades, once you design the infrastructure and put it out in the marketplace, it needs to last for several generations. So to, do, to, to serve the, the uh, market well, not only you have to address the, the uh, business changes, but also adapt to uh, technology uh, changes as well. So I'll talk about uh, innovation envelope in terms of uh, the whole picture, but uh, you will see more discussion along the line of the uh, within the uh, hardware system environment. So this is a, so the slide you saw earlier was a high level view. So this is more like at a, uh, you know, physical uh, la la layer view. So a typical <clears throat> test. So typical uh, blade environment button. So blade server and infrastructure 
has many elements. Uh, as you can see here, there are, you know, server blades, IO blades, so on, and then there are some switches integrated within the enclosure, the back blades to interconnect them, and the life support system, including power cooling management, and of course, the enclosure house them together. Um, there are a few blade server systems out there that you can look at. They all look kind of similar. Uh, they all have some blades, they all have some interconnect modules and so on. But um, if you go under the hood, there are some subtle differences and over time, how the trade-offs are made in addressing the, the technologies and, and uh, business changes as I discussed earlier, there are differences in how these trade-offs are made. Okay? So there are a lot to, to talk about around the uh, HP Blade System C-Class. Uh, I'll defer that you to, to go look at these references, which I listed at the end of the uh, presentation. But I just highlight a few things that are relevant to this talk. So this is a picture of a uh, C7000 enclosure, which is an instantiation of the C-Class uh, architecture, showing uh, 16 blades at the front, power supplies down here with a little display to to monitor and so on. At the back are fans here, top and bottom, and in uh, the middle is where you see a lot of these interconnect bays, including uh, at the bottom is the, the management modules. So at the front, you can scale the volume space, go along with the power, uh, cooling, connectivity, and so on. At the back, you can also scale. In other words, you can double up, quadruple the volume space to scale both front and back, okay? The, uh, here's a cartoon that illustrates the, the middle, uh, the inside of the blade enclosure where you see in the middle is a back blade, and at the fr on the left side is the blade, on the right side is the interconnect or switch module, and on each, within each module, there are chips. So for the, the context of this presentation, uh, I use this you know, NIC chip or network and face controller chip and switch chip, interconnecting across the back plane. Because of this integrated nature, we have these traces via pins connecting between the chips, eliminate the need for um, uh, expensive transceivers, cables, and so on. So in addition to that, there are other things like um, uh, so-called serial deserializer or CERTES that make it possible for many of the protocols to be overlaid on the same set of pins. So in short, we can highlight the complexity and cost within this integrated environment and give you opportunities to innovate, especially when the two ends are interconnected and you have kind of like a control on both ends, okay? And you will see this cartoon reappear in a slightly different form throughout the, this presentation. So here is a picture uh, where you see at the top are the server. Where's the dot? Um, anyway, you can see that the, the three columns. Uh, the top row is uh, the server blade. The bottom rows are these eight uh, in, connect, in a connect switch base. The point here is that there are, you know, typically we have these one gigabit or let's just call them uh, 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 small pipes. Or, and then as we go along the technology trend, the pipe gets bigger. So how we can con consolidate many uh, uh, smaller pipes into fewer fatter pipes. And uh, complementary to that is a lot of uh, standards and, and, and work going on around, along the, the line of converging fabrics by uh, encapsulating, you know, protocol encapsulations. For example, this fiber channel encapsulate over ethernet. Thank you. That's the clicker. This is just oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Pew, pew. Um, so, so uh, here examples show the uh, you know, multiple uh, gigabit Ethernet and fiber channel interconnect modules. This is a, a, a typical, not not a typical uh, 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 configuration for things like virtual machine environment when you need several uh, network ports. So when 10 gigabit comes along. Blade's a great place to start with because you don't have to deal with expensive transceiver and cables. We can hide this, this, this technology in here and kind of 
lump all these onto one trap, one uh, bigger pipe, and over time you can encapsulate fiber channels. So this is how uh, you can illustrate these uh, blade server. You know, you can start seeing the the the, uh, the innovation area. In addition to to these fiber channel example, there are other uh, integration opportunities. Uh, both not only between the, the, the front and back or blade to serve, but also blade to blade or switch to switch and so on. Okay. The, um, so I'm going to, so this is, so I finished with the, the setup slides. So we're going to go through about 10 slides to go look at the uh, innovation uh, case studies. There are three case studies that I'm going to talk about. Um, for each, I'll explain more. This is just to what your, app or your appetite on. The first one is so-called virtual connect um, to, to make sure that the, the networking uh, uh, problems are solved with minimum disruption to the uh, common practices. The second one is, uh, you know, once you have the fat pipe, how can you make this fat pipe to be more uh, uh, efficiently used? And the third one is, is called a, a VEPA, which is a virtual ethernet port aggregator, ag aggregation, which is a standard and which is not a product yet. This is still a, a standard uh, work going on. The first two have been shipped. One point that I want to drive here is when we make these happen or plan to make these happen, what are the things that we need to, to do within the, at the architectural level and at the implementation levels to innovate things in a way that, that one will become a stepping stone for the, another. Okay, so I'll, I'll show you what that means later. Okay, so this is, before I start on the innovation uh, specific on those three things I mentioned, I want to talk to you a little bit on this so-called so pre-boot configuration environment. This is an enabler to allow us to go through this series of innovations. So what it is is basically uh, we want to program something that was quote unquote hardwired, right? So what you would say, a NIC, uh, it's, a, it's a MAC address hardwire, a fiber channel HBA, worldwide name hardwired, quote unquote. So how can we do it in such a way that we want to, to reconfigure these commodity components in a way that we can provide more value to the customer as well as try to look for product differentiation features. So the way how it works is, so, uh, is here's a blade, uh, back blade in the middle, and here's the, the interconnect modules. So before we start anything, uh, these things are, are powered by auxiliary power. So at pre-boot time, there are things that, that the, the manager, set of manager handshake and talk to each other and say, hey, you know, I want to make this, this chip to do something a little different. So the user will input the information somehow and those information will somehow be populated in some locations that we can go use later on. So this is done at the uh, pre-boot time. And when uh, you, you turn on a, a server, it goes to the boot process. During the boot process, it will pick up the necessary information from the non-volatile memory somewhere stored, be it on, the ch on an adapter card or system board, and then this baseboard management controller will pull that information, hand it over to the uh, system so firmware, uh, software such as uh, a BIOS or, or a system firmware as in the EFI environment. And then the, the, uh, the uh, system firmware will hand over this information to a device specific uh, option ROM, which will be loaded at boot time. And then this option ROM code will then Tell the device firmware and say, okay, here's this information, go deposit it somewhere that you can use later. So that's how we go through pre-boot and during boot process to deposit things to make a commodity component do something a little differently than originally intended. And uh, to do that, in uh, many cases, we try to leverage standards. And in some cases, when we couldn't get uh, the standards to do what we want to do, we went ahead and, and proposed a necessary modification to standard or proposed a brand new one, such as VEPA. So first innovation is called Virtual Connect, um, where we have uh, so, uh, uh, switches in the enclosure 
connecting multiple blades to external world, right? So that solved the cable management problem. But as you know, an enclosure has limited number of blades. Therefore, when you have many enclosures, now you have many switches. So some time ago, uh, before blades, uh, people say, hey, here's a big switch where you have, say, a number of or network admin assigned to a, a number of switches. Now you got an order or two order of magnitudes more switches. What do you do? Now you, 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 you either hire more people or, or do something that disrupt your, your, your data center management practices. So to address that, we create this, this virtual connect. Oh, one other thing is uh, server admin, uh, server and network admin domain. So before network admin do, uh, can walk up to the server and say, here's the cable, you know, you plug it in, right? <clears throat> the back of the server is where it, it, it touches. In Blade, the back of the server is a back blade and can't go touch it. So, you, you know, how do you do? So you, you got this clash on not starting from procurement, deployment, servicing, and so on between server and network admin. So the thought is, <clears throat> take this, this uh, oh, I don't have a picture there, but I'll hand wave here. So you got a server blade here, you got a network here, here's the enclosure. So move the touch point or ex for, for the network admin from the back of the, the server to back of the enclosure. How do you do that? So we make this, this switch to be quote unquote transparent to a point that network admin doesn't have to, to manage it, but server admin will admi uh, manage it. <clears throat> So the benefit you gain are that uh, you have um, cleaner administration uh, uh, policies, and uh, as a bonus, you get a you know if you want to migrate application from one server blade to another server blade, you, th there are ways that we can do to make that migration to be a lot smoother. And we try to make things in a way that modifications on the chips to be minimum, uh, so that you know we can introduce product sooner as well as uh, uh, use that stepping stone uh, uh, approach on, you know, go slow first and then pick up uh, speed as we go. How Virtual Connect works, here's a picture, a cartoon again. So back blade in the middle, blade at the top, switches in, uh, at the bottom here. So this is where the touch point used to be and we want to move the touch point to the, the back of the enclosure, right? So <clears throat> to do that, uh, using the pre-boot configuration environment, PCE, we deposit things in here for the NICs to, to have certain ident uh, identities, such as MAC address or, or, or uh, in the case of Five Channel, will be a worldwide name. And then we make that, that addresses appear here. So that method in Ethernet is already done, right? Uh, with the layer two bridging, you, you, you get that feature already. But what we did in addition to that was to make this interconnect module to be like a, oh, say wiring closet, right? You, you want to move this to there or you want to, you want to aggregate ports or you want to put them in different islands. So think of it as somebody walking in and actually moving things around or reconfiguring things. So we provided ways for the, the pre-boot configuration and also the management, uh, interconnect module management tool to, to, to accomplish that. At the end, what you get is, uh, this module does not participate in the data center spanning tree protocol. So we, we did things to prevent loops so that you know, traffic won't be going round and round. Um, we also, uh, so we also allow the, the aggregation of ports. Those are pretty standard you know, uh, features that people want to have. Uh, and one other thing we did to accomplish the, the uh, moving things around or is as traffic goes in, we tag, add a tag to it of in a VLAN tag, if you will. Um, if the traffic doesn't have a tag already, we just add a tag and at, when the traffic exit, we strip the tag off. So the traffic here won't even know that it was tagged before within the uh, interconnect module. If the traffic coming in has a VLAN tag already for out of VLANs here, then we translate it temporarily to, to use it in, for internal use. And then when it leaves it, we translate it back to the original VLAN tag. And by doing that, and in conjunction with making these virtual connect module to be cascadable, we can cascade many of these uh, uh, modules across multiple enclosures. Okay. Um, the next innovation is called Flex 10, which you saw a little bit earlier. The idea is you can support 10 gigabit 
by using a for example a dual port you know a NIC chip here no problem what it does is so this is before and below is a after picture right so before and after so in uh, after we apply flex attend to it uh, we create these pipe I mean we make this pipe to be splittable into multiples and these multiples can have varying uh, capabilities so how do we do that again using the pre-boot configuration oh before I go to that that, that will be discussed next, uh, on the next slide um, to do that we did things that require some chip modification in this uh, case it added about 20 percent or so more uh, gates to the chip to the the, the uh, you know off the shelf uh, 10 gig NIC chip and the uh, benefit is that by doing that you essentially have uh, multiple NICs within one chip which you used to have before but now you have more you know a flexible way of, of managing those things and uh, what you do here is transparent to the outside uh, the, the, the follow-on switches that you connect to <coughs> sorry so there are two pictures I'll show you how flex 10 works uh, one is for the typical OS and the next one will be for the virtual machine environment uh, it's kind of busy here, but if you can just look at the the blue color path here. Uh, so this is a host OS running on a blade, and this green box is the uh, uh, a NIC chip, a Flex 10 chip, where you have these PCI Express physical functions uh, F0 to F7. Each function is is treated as a a NIC, right? So that's how the dual port NIC work today. You got two functions, and, you, and one uh, each function being enumerated by the the OS to uh, as a NIC. Similar here, the difference is that we have more. Not only we have more, we have pre-boot configuration uh, before pre-boot to tell the NIC what to do or how to configure these these slices. Uh, have more bandwidth, less bandwidth. QoS and so on. So, so here the stuff that we, we put in, in addition to the more traditional like MAC address, uh, 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 pre um, Pixie boot or not, and so on. So once we did that, uh, during the operation, th th this receive transmit queues in the OS is associated with this. There are you know independent path, if you will, for these these uh, flex NICs to be used by each, uh, um, if, uh, each driver instances. And at the tail end, it's fairly standard way of you know, how do you, how do you uh, uh, manage the VLAN tags and so on. This is, uh, in the middle is a uh, uh, um, network controller side interconnect connecting to the management controller. So the idea is, you know, if you have a baseboard management controller on the, inside the server, you don't need to have that baseboard management NIC to, be, to have yet another physical path, right? So you can have that baseboard management controller NIC come through here, and then you can write on, on one of these, these uh, virtual uh, 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 network pipes so that you can have uh, one connection, if you will, to, to connect to many uh, networks, including the, the management network. You can split out on the the tail end of the virtual connect flex 10 switch module or interconnect module to have dedicated path to have a you know if the, the, the data center requires that isolation the next picture is very similar to the first one the difference is that now you have this virtual intermediary this is a PCI Express uh, term used in the the single root and multi root IO virtualization specification uh, a lot of us know this as a hypervisor or VMM inside there is a v virtual switch and then there's a virtual NIC uh, for each VM instance which is this system image one through X here okay again if you look at these little blue uh, queues uh, for receive transmit there's associated queue at the uh, physical function level and what happened is this virtual switch, as you know, connect to these virtual machines, and then the the uh, the port that goes out to the physical NIC connectivity. That's where the the, the same NIC ports are aggregated, shown by these these purple uh, arrows here. Once you get to this this uh, NIC chip, there are these independent stack that you can go through. 
then the rest is pretty much uh, as I mentioned. So the, the block here, these are the stuff that, that pretty much uh, 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 require change, some changes to the, to the uh, uh, NIC. Um, well, I'm kind of running short on time, so let me speed up and, and uh, we'll get, come back to, to some of these discussions later on if you have any questions. So the third one is VEPA, uh, which is a, a virtual Ethernet port aggregation. So the idea is this. You have virtual machine talking to each other you, through this virtual switch, right? Uh, with SR IOV or single root IOV, you'll be, have a NIC chip that you can instantiate or you can associate a virtual function to each virtual machine. Now, there is this peer-to-peer -peer uh, uh, communication that can go on using this virtual Ethernet bridge or VEB, but if the network admin say, hey, you know, I, I'm managing these physical machines, I, I want to have visibility to this traffic, it, they don't have the visibility of this virtual machine traffic. How do you do it is to push these traffic out and bring it back in so that you can do a little richer, apply a little richer management features on these uh, network traffic. Okay, so th this is this is the tr three bullets mentioned that, and this fourth bullet is pretty much say you know you can do a lot of these fancy or r rich feature networking uh, 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 features on the NIC itself on SRV NIC, but there are a lot of issues in doing that, and at the end you you're not doing a good job anyway. So let's push it out to a, a edge level switch, and let's do a li lot richer management thingies, and then amortize that across multiple servers. So you can have a better cost model for doing that. All right, so we mentioned that already. Um, how VEPA works, uh, there are, by the way, there are a proposal you can look up on the web, uh, look at the uh, references and, and you can understand a lot better than what I can tell you here. Uh, so virtual machine here, SRLV NIC here, virtual function that associate to each virtual machine, different from how we explain Flex 10. Uh, here you can have the switch uh, uh, inside the NIC chip and these, it, uh, t you could have just route this traffic and go back here, right? You can just, just loop back within the switch, which is a virtual Ethernet bridge uh, feature. But in this case, VEPA, after negotiating with this at boot time to know that, that uh, there's a, a uh, VEPA uh, there's a, a module that can comprehend VEPA. So it will always send out this traffic out there and then if traffic is meant for these one of the virtual machine, it'll loop back and, and, um, and go to these. Otherwise, it'll go out by using address uh, mask in the address table. In summary, we had gone through these uh, Blade environment and show you, explain to you, hey, it's a it's catalyst for innovation because of the integrated nature, nature and so on. Uh, at the same time, you know, we have to deal with the, the, uh, the, the vo volume economics, standards, and so on. So how can we walk this thin line between, you know, you've got to comply with the standards, you've got to leverage the high volume, but at the same time, you want to, to differentiate. This is true for both system uh, OEM as well as the chip vendors. And I illustrated three concepts which, are, which use the pre-boot configuration and other few things as a a uh, common method and one is stepping stone for the other. And at the end of the day, you have to translate all those into some meaningful metric that's value for the customers, right? Like how much cheaper or how much more uh, uh, power, how much power do you save and so on. So all, those, I don't really stress them, but you know, those are part of the fundamental thinking and requirements anyway. And for VEPA, there are stuff that you can look up and uh, we also published uh, patches to, to uh, virtual machine monitors to, to, uh, to, to, to uh, implement VEP, uh, V ports to support VEPA. So, as closing remark, um, I talked about you know, how Blade environment integrated nature allow chip innovation to be, to be uh, uh, created. Uh, because you have, you, you have control on both sides and you have this pre-boot environment and so on. Um, there are things that we also want to, to address at a you know, like OS and uh, application level as well. We mentioned a little bit, but a lot more we can do about it. Okay? So it's not just only hardware, but 
other uh, areas that we need to address to make this more holistic uh, approach to create an uh, innovation envelope to be really effective. Um, so here are the list of uh, things that we can go look at as opportunities. Uh, the first one's pretty much uh, understood. You heard the previous uh, 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 presenters talked about the process memory, but there are a lot of challenges in the power cooling, especially in a dense environment. How do we make those problems to be easy, uh, solved easier? And also the, uh, in the, on the next side, you know, the small messages, which are sort of the most commonly used, but 10 gig NICs are not really efficient to support small messages. How can we make that to be better so that when 40 gig and 100 gig comes along, you know, we'll have really efficient systems to support those to get really full line rate. And um, then there are these uh, flash devices, as you know. You know, we have the memory, we've got the disk. Now there are things that we can do within the memory itself, within this itself, as well as in between. How can we make this a holistic approach in a way that at the end, you have a more uh, efficient environment. Like, can you knock out, you know, 200 drives by throwing in this little, you know, flash card on PCI Express and, and use only 10 drives, for example. And I'm not making that. There are some case studies that we went through to really make that happen. And uh, this is a big one. Uh, the chips are almost there, like 17, 20 gigabit. 25 gigabit is one to get there to, to get 100 gigabit with four lanes. But hey, you know, chips are there, connectors are there, connectors are saying 26 gigabit already. But when you look at the media itself, boards, uh, especially for mainstream, to make it economic, economic boards is a really difficult push beyond 10 gigabit, beyond you know, a certain number of traces. And you know, should there be board, right? So there are optics and all the things you can talk about. Um, we mentioned that already. And last but not least, there are things that, you know, we took it for granted as a IO interface or PC, PCI Express for inter part, IO interface and so on. But can we do that? Can we use that link for something else? Um, there are a lot of opportunities around that. Uh, thank you very much. I ran out of time. Thank you. Any questions? So I've got a question. So there's a natural tension between you know, integrating everything on a single chip and then having it off chip, in which case you can specialize it for blades or whatever system you're working on these days. So you know, how do you see this trade of playing along? If the NIC was integrated in the same chip as the CPUs, be much less flexibility to do some of the innovations you talked about at the system level. So how are so, you dealing so with this trade? Let me, uh, I couldn't, it's kind of muffling, so let me repeat what I understood. So there's a trade off between high integration single chip versus multi diff different chips versus doing flexibility, fl different flexibility. Different. Yeah, yeah yeah so uh, as you know you know the the uh, in high volume business what are the the uh, the most commonly used features and, and and how many platforms you can go address from top to bottom on the price performance scales right so wherever it's, it, it makes sense to integrate it helps in terms of reducing things like a, a, a component account as well as help you on these like on chip communication speed and so on. So uh, I, I would say it has to be case by case basis. Uh, it will boil down to, to what time frame are we targeting this particular chip or chipsets and then we'll see what was the right solution to which product we need to cover to solve which problems and then we'll go from there. Alan Cantor, Nalatech. Um, uh, basically, you've talked obviously in great detail about the mid plane in, and um, merging the Ethernet traffic across it. Are you not considering turning the mid plane into PCI Express and then just uh, the rear transition cards take PCI Express to the appropriate transport layer? Um, good question. So, so, what you saw in terms of protocol encapsulation in Ethernet is done at the networking layer, right? Networking level. So there are a lot of built-in uh, uh, features within these protocols to think, uh, for things like isolation, right? So if you yank a blade out or switch out, 
the effect on the remaining systems are minimum. It knows how to handle it because that has been the case all along. But now if you put use PCI Express as a common fabric to do things like networking, there are a lot of features that has to go in within this PCI Express fabric to address things like how do you isolate them well because PCI Express, how it started was PCI programming model. The, the memory map of each system is, is you know, it's, it's, it's very localized. Even though PCI SIG came up with these address translation uh, specifications and MRIOV and so on, there are still work to do, a lot of work to do at a higher level for these to be use, useful products that customers won't scare, you know, touching it, right? That's one thing. The other is, is the, the bandwidth efficiencies. And PCI Express is not as aggressive as let's say Ethernet or infinite band for that matter. Uh, then there's this overhead on the protocol itself, which is improving, but um, there are a lot of st a lower level uh, 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 protocol issues that we need to go address to make it a truly usable uh, 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 fabric for generic use. But the direction is, is to con continue to discuss, uh, 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 explore these possibilities. Thank you for asking. Uh, hello, David Cantor from Real World Tech. Uh, so some, uh, you were talking about a lot of the innovations uh, in terms of like I.O. virtualization in the context of blade servers. Um, do you see, some of this is clearly not applicable to volume rack mounted servers, but do you see things like the uh, NIC aggregation and NIC virtualization to get better utilization of your 10 gigabit ethernet? Is that something you'd wanna drive into rack mounted servers? Absolutely, yes. Uh, as you know, you know, we went from one meg to 10 meg to 100 meg and one gig, right? That evolution will, will go on. And just around the corner, we have 40 gig and 100 gig waiting. Now, what do we do? I don't see us doing today, well, we can see, kind of see us doing like two 10 gig NIC, right? But then what do you do with these NICs? Now, do you see us doing eight 10 gig NICs today? Probably not. So. So it makes sense to use these fatter pipes to, and, and the question that next is, how do you use these pipes? Uh, how do you make these to be more efficient? Uh, so even though rack mount, you no, know, within a rack mount environment, there can be some level of integration, not necessarily at the level of blade, but, but maybe a few nodes having aggregation and so on. Thanks. Mohammed Halal, I'm from Vepro, and uh, we are working on next generation cooling solutions. My question to you is that, uh, do you do a lot of innovation you mentioned on the, on the cooling side, or you basically take uh, the CPU suppliers recommended uh, heat sinks and uh, cooling solutions? For the products, we do leverage a lot of the vendor uh, recommended methods, but in the labs and in uh, uh, drawing boards, we do have several considerations to think what would be the best way to cool in terms not only to, for the heat extraction purposes, but also power consumption purposes, right? So the answer, short answer is yes. Long answer we can take offline. Okay. Thank you very much. So let's thank Kevin once again. So 